Okay, so we're going to chart, uh, start chapter 7, which is the use of energy nutrients, metabolism and balance. So metabolism is defined as the continuous processes whereby living organisms and cells convert nutrients into energy, body structure, and waste. And they are controlled by two major reactions in metabolic activity. There is anabolism, which is using absorbed nutrients to build or synthesize more complex compounds. If you think of anabolic steroids, they build. Cat uh, catabolism is splitting complex structures or substances into simpler substances. So uh, catabolism is going to break things down. In that same sense, the Krebs cycle, which is also called the citric acid cycle or that tricarboxylic acid, the TCA cycle, it converts glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids to a usable form of energy requiring a bunch of enzymes, maybe a couple coenzymes, right? We need those vitamins and minerals. The anabolic processes require energy. So in order to build anything, build muscle or um, build, you know, if you it heal tissue or, uh, you know, grow a baby, uh, you need the energy. And then hormones are kind of like the messengers that will produce I'm sorry, they are produced by a group of cells and they either stimulate or retard the functions of other cells. Basically, it means that just like uh, medications, they don't actually uh, make your body do things they wouldn't normally do. Um, it just either will, uh, you know, increase or suppress normal body functions already. This is in your book on page 122. This is figure 7.1. Um, this is kind of that breakdown of how we get, uh, you know, proteins, which are broken down into amino acids. Now, 50% of the amino acids minus nitrogen can turn into that pyruvate. 50% of the amino acids uh, could also go to that acetyl-CoA, um, which will contribute to the Krebs cycle, right? Even though the book says it's not calling it the Krebs cycle anymore, it's just going to uh, always call it. I, I wish the publisher weren't so lazy and would just replace Krebs cycle with TCA cycle every time if it says it's going to do that, but I guess not. Carbohydrates, this is the straight path, right? It's going to go from the carbohydrate, going to be broken down into glucose, uh, which can then be turned into pyruvate, which of course pyruvate can go back into uh, glycogen, right? We can store that glycogen. Uh, or pyruvate can go down to acetyl-CoA, which goes into the TCA cycle, which, uh, you know, the byproducts of the TCA cycle are going to be energy, H2O, or water, and CO2, which is carbon dioxide. Same thing happens with fats. So about 5% of the fat can be turned into glycerol, right? And that glycerol is um, um, part of the triglycerides, right? And then the other 95% are going to get turned into fatty acids. Um, and those can then be broken down into acetyl-CoA, which can enter the, um, the Krebs cycle. So the liver plays a huge role in sort of regulating how everything gets broken down. And so it regulates uh, by controlling the kinds and the quantities of the nutrients that are going into the bloodstream. So as we saw in uh, chapter three, when we were talking about digestion, how the uh, everything goes into the liver from the, um, the small intestine, it travels through the portal vein into the liver, and the liver sort of figures out what gets to stay and what doesn't get to stay. It's going to detoxify things, right? So it's going to break things down for us, um, like medications. Um, that's a good thing. It breaks down alcohol, which is a good thing, um, although it might not be good for the liver. And then glycogen can be broken down into glucose and released into the circulating blood as needed. Your liver kind of is always checking up and being, you know, like, is do we need more glucose or do we need... Uh, you know, more of this vitamin or do we need, um, you know, more amino acids? It's always kind of, you know, keeping tabs on sort of the, the stock room in the blood and to see which one do we need to, you know, send out on the journey next. Um, 
Other end products of digestion may be oxidized to provide energy. So converted to glucose, protein, fat, or other substances, or released to circulate at prescribed levels in the blood for use by all the cells. Here's that image of that. You'll see this in your book on page 123. So you eat the food, it goes into the small intestine. You know, it has to make its way to the small intestine, right? The small intestine enzymes um, break things down and then you have glucose, right? Which is good, that's what we want. Now all this glucose is in the bloodstream right after we eat, we have a lot of it. So then our pancreas seeing that, hey, there's a bunch of glucose in this bloodstream is going to start pumping out insulin, which is what we need when blood glucose is high, right? When blood glucose is high, our bodies produce insulin. And then insulin is how our cells are able to absorb the glucose, right? But if it doesn't get absorbed, it's gonna pass back through the liver and the liver is going to kind of help to filter some of that out. And then back on this side of the liver, we're able to see that our blood glucose level has come back down to normal and there's still just a little bit of insulin because there's still just a little bit of uh, glucose. The kidney plays a role in metabolism as well. So it's going to remove the waste products from the blood. Um, along with the liver, it's going to control those levels of the nutrient that's in the blood. So it basically filters out um, the things that you know we need to get rid of and it will filter and reabsorb things it still needs depending on what the body needs. So if blood glucose is low, then the kidneys aren't going to be filtering out glucose, right? Because the body still needs it. If blood glucose is high, then it will help to filter out some of that glucose. So it's gonna filter things like glucose, amino acids, vitamins, water, and other minerals. And in doing that, it's going to help to maintain nutrient balance. Okay, so carbohydrates are broken down into monosaccharides. Those are then you know, absorbed and transported through that portal vein, the portal vein being like a pretty important vein from the small intestine to the liver. It get traveled to the liver for glycogenesis, right? Glycogenesis is where we basically create glycogen, right? It's a process where we use sugars like fructose, galactose, sorbitol, and xylitol, and we store them as glycogen. Those are our you know, main sources of, of uh, energy storage. The liver is going to closely monitor that glucose level in the bloodstream, right? So if someone is hyperglycemic, they have high blood, blood glucose or high blood sugar. And if they're hypoglycemic, glycemia, they have low blood glucose. Then we come into something called the glycemic index. Now a glycemic index is just going to measure the effect that different carbohydrate foods have on blood glucose level. And they do so through um, like how quickly we can break down the glucose or the whatever the carbohydrate is and then that it can be absorbed so if it's slow maybe it is bound to uh, fiber fiber is going to slow down that absorption it's going to be lower on the glycemic index but if it's broken down super easily then it's going to be high on the glycemic index. So uh, something like watermelon is not very fibrous. It has a lot of water, which is very easy to break down uh, because we don't bother breaking down water cells themselves. And then um, it's very easy to break down watermelon. Um, but something more like a, like a sweet potato, it also has uh, glucose, but it's really bound tight by fiber. So it's not going to be very high on the glycemic index. Um, another part of this whole section here is going to be monitored um, and insulin is going to play a role here, right? You guys know about that. Anytime we talk about uh, glycemic index or glu blood glucose, we're gonna be talking about insulin, right? Because insulin is that hormone that lowers the blood glucose levels. And then the glycemic in, the glycemic effect goes along with this part because it is the rate at which glucose rises in the bloodstream after a particular 
uh, food is eaten. So if we eat something that is high on that glycemic index, we're going to say that there is a glycemic effect. And that means that our blood sugar is going to spike up super high quickly after we eat it. Um, if it is low on the glycemic index, then it's going to have less of a glycemic effect and our blood sugar isn't going to shoot up super high. It's going to go up, of course, because it has, it has glucose, but it's going to be more steady and stable. And then, of course, we have glucogenesis, which is the process of synthesizing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Um, red blood cells and cells in the heart, brain, and renal medulla will prefer glucose as their energy source. Basically, every cell <laughs> produce, or prefers glucose, but most importantly, red blood cells and then cells in the heart, brain, well, the renal medulla is pretty close to the brain. You don't have to worry about that part. Just the heart and the brain. As far as protein metabolism goes, um, those amino acids that are broken down in the small intestine will be transported to the liver via the portal vein, just like the carbs are. Um, there is a constant dynamic state between anabolism and catabolism, and it's going to be controlled by the liver and by hormones. Those hormones, of course, are insulin, thyroxine, and growth hormone stimulant. Um, I'm sorry, growth hormone will stimulate protein synthesis. So those three, insulin, thyroxine, and growth hormone, are going to either promote or they're going to retard uh, protein synthesis. And then, your book also goes into this again. Uh, anabolism is going to utilize that amino acid pool, which there's about 70 grams of amino acids at any given time in the liver. Um, and it's going to do so to maintain equilibrium. Now your, like it says in that video, I am sure you guys watched, um, your liver doesn't kind of hold on to things. If it's not already ready to go, like we don't have all of the amino acids necessary in order to make the protein. Um, we're not gonna be able to make the protein. It's not like, oh, well, you know, this month I eat phenylalanine, but next month I'll eat tryptophan, right? It doesn't work that way. You need a kind of a good assortment of the amino acids at any given time in order to be able to kind of quickly, ready to go, uh, synthesize those proteins as soon as they're needed, okay? Otherwise, you don't make those proteins. And then of the catabolism, that also occurs in the liver, muscle, and kidney, and it creates uh, urea as a waste product, right? Because we know that when we break down proteins, um, that nitrogen is given off, which is turned into ammonia, which is bad for us, which is turned into urea, which is how we get rid of it. So then uh, where are lipids broken down? Well, they're broken down in the small intestine, but who, who regulates the, the uh, metabolism of the fats? You guessed it, the liver. So lipogenesis is going to convert glucose to fat. And then lipolysis, of course, anytime you see the word lysis, it means break down, is going to break down fat. Um, and as we learned from Leo the lion says Gur, the oxidation process of hydrolyzing triglycerides to enter the Krebs cycle for energy production. And if you flip back to page 122, you'll remember that fats are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids, and those fatty acids are turned into acetyl-CoA. Carbohydrates are gonna play a pretty big role in heavy exercise when the muscle's oxygen supply is limited. So in this, of course, our, our body uses carbohydrates. It stores the glycogen, right? Um, and when you have plenty of oxygen in your system, you can use your fat to break down um, this kind of stuff. But when you go beyond where you don't have enough oxygen, right, then you have to turn to um, glycogen, right? So anytime you're doing cardio, you're going to be using your um, glycogen, that fast energy. All right, same as everything else, alcohol is going to be metabolized primarily by the liver. In case you didn't know, your liver is what breaks down alcohol. <laughs> um, when you consume a lot of alcohol, it, it, when it's in excessive amounts, alcohol is actually going to be a toxin for your liver. It's going to damage your liver. So, of course, people who have you know, liver disease, um, if they were ever an alcoholic, that's going to play a role in that, right? 
Alcohol has a pretty marked effect on blood pressure and the risk of hypertension. So people who consume alcohol um, in excessive amounts, often without moderation, they have higher um, blood pressure usually, um, and they have that risk of hypertension. The dietary guidelines advise moderation in alcohol consumption. So for this, this means one drink a day for women and no more than two drinks a day for men, right? This is considered moderation. I don't know about you guys, I don't drink a day or drink every day, uh, but maybe, you know, maybe you do. Um, so a drink is going to be defined as either 12 ounces of a regular beer, five ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of an 80 proof distilled spirit. Okay, so as we've already talked about, anytime you consume too much of any nutrient, it's going to result in excess energy being stored as adipose tissue, right? Everything can get turned into fat uh, because our body wants to store as much uh, calorie as it can in order to make sure we survive the next time we can eat. Fat is going to be a good source. Well, actually, okay, so protein can be turned into energy, but it's a really terrible source. Fat is a good source of energy, but carbohydrates are the preferred uh, fuel. They are the easiest to break down. They are the most straightforward. Uh, we can break them down directly into glucose without having to, you know, do any little extra steps. So carbs are the way to go. Um, and also our body can't break down a bunch of fat without having some side effects like ketoacidosis, hyperlipidemia, and that accumulation of fat in our liver. So it kind of just sort of tries to not do that. <laughs> um, Catabolism of all classes of food stuff is going to involve oxidation, right? So remember Leo the lion um, through the TCA cycle, which is going to produce energy, right? So everything gets broken down into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA enters the uh, TCA cycle. It gets turned into adenosine triphosphate. Um, and then in whenever we need energy, we like break off a little phosphate and that's going to produce energy. We get turns into adenosine diphosphate, uh, and then it kind of gets reloaded back into the TCA cycle and gets the phosphate reattached. Anyway, um, so each nutrient has a very specific function. All of the nutrients have to be present simultaneously for optimal benefits. So uh, carbohydrates can be used in forming non-essential amino acids, right? We have to use that energy in order to make our protein synthesis. Uh, proteins contribute to the synthesis of some lipids, right? Like lipoproteins. We need proteins in order to transport fats through our, our bloodstream. And then lipids don't contribute significantly to the synthesis of amino acids. Glycerol from triglycerides can be used for synthesis of carbohydrates, right? So we can make carbohydrates, or, well, not carbohydrates, but we can make glucose from uh, the glycerol in a triglyceride. So everything has a very uh, harmonious relationship with everything else. You have to have all of it working together. You can't get rid of any one nutrient by itself. And your book says to go to uh, figure 7.3 down at the bottom of page 125. You'll see how um, everything just end up getting stored as post tissue, unfortunately. Here's how this works. And of course, you're, you're already very familiar with these, but you eat a carbohydrate that turns into glucose. Uh, and then glycogenesis is where it turns it into uh, glycogen. And it's going to refill the liver and muscle needs. Anytime you have extra, it goes into adipose tissue. Fatty acids, they have lipogenesis, right? Where we create triglycerides. But anytime you have extra, it gets stored as adipose tissue. You have amino acids, they go through gluconeogenesis in order to make glucose, and then it can be turned into either glycogen or triglycerides. Any extra, of course, goes into adipose tissue. Okay, so a kilocalorie is going to be uh, determined by the amount of heat that is required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. So, you know, if we were living in any other country in the world, these would be very common terms for you. But one uh, kilogram um, of water, one degree Celsius. That is the amount of energy or heat that is required in order to become a kilocalorie. 
carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and even alcohol provide energy, right? Those are our macronutrients. They are nutrient providing and the physiological energy values that are commonly used are going to be four calories per gram for carbohydrates, nine calories per gram for fat, four calories per gram for protein, and seven calories per gram for alcohol. Seven calories per gram for alcohol is one that I have not said yet out loud, but that is going to be something that you could very well see on your board exams, um, not the alcohol part, but any one of those um, physiologic energy values. So those are pretty important. Um, if you are someone who kind of counts macros already, you're probably pretty aware of those. And of course, they find out how many calories or kilocalories there are in a type of food by putting it into this really weird machine here. Um, and they suck out all the air um, and they, they put the little dried, dehydrated bit of food right there, the food sample, um, in this bomb chamber <laughs> and then it's surrounded by water. It's in fact, uh, you, you'll probably remember from the last slide, one kilogram of water here. This is a kilogram is in, in weight, by the way. And then um, it has a, a stirrer, isn't that nice? It has an ignition wire and a thermometer. So the amount of energy or heat that this, you know, kind of burning this food stuff here in the middle is going to give off if it raises the thermometer, you know, one uh, degree Celsius, then it's going to be one kilocalorie. The amount of energy or calories available in a food may be precisely calculated by placing a weight amount on a calorimeter, or I don't really know how to say that. Calorimeter sounds good. Um, as the food is burned, the increase in water temperature indicates the heat given off or our potential free energy of that food. This is, it's, it's very scientific way of measuring this. It, it gives us a sort of basis, but I think it's terrible. I think it's super lame. Does this look anything like everything we've learned in digestion here in this class? No, it doesn't. So the idea that this is the same way we break down food, which granted, we, we do certainly break the food down um, and we take the energy off of it, um, but, you know, it's, I, I don't know, I don't think that this is a very great way to measure how our bodies react to food. Um, it's just sort of a way to standardize, you know, um, energy, I guess. I don't know. I don't think it's great. Okay, so I was talking about this in the last slide, actually, but ATP is one of the byproducts of, well, it's not, it's not like a byproduct, it is the product of the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle, right? We produce adenosine triphosphate um, and it is the instant source of cellular energy for mechanical work, transport of nutrients and waste products, and synthesis of chemical compounds generated from the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle, right? Um, they're also called high energy phosphate compounds. Uh, and your book says that they are the currency or money that the body uses for energy. So because we can use ATP without oxygen, this classification is considered anaerobic. And our body has to have the supply of ATP because at any given moment, uh, we're going to need a lot of energy. Um, and you just never know when that's going to be. Well, your body doesn't anyway. Moving on to BMR, which or basal metabolic rate. So energy, or your BMI, is going to be defined as the energy required for involuntary physiologic functions to maintain life. This is going to include respiration, circulation, maintenance of muscle tone, and body temperature. So you just, you know, being alive is how many calories you're going to burn in a day. It gets measured um, in a clinical setting using indirect Kilometry, so it, uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and the amount of energy required when the body is in a post absorptive state. So, this is anywhere from 12 to 15 hours after you've eaten something, um, is kind of how your body functions there. Whenever you're, you've eaten within like the last 12 hours, um, your body's still digesting that food, and digestion requires energy. So, uh, your body isn't kind of at its lowest. 
So your BMR, your basal metabolic rate, is its lowest whenever you're laying down, right? So you're not using any energy to hold yourself up. You are awake and rested. Uh, relaxed means you're not moving around, you're not restless. Um, you're in a comfortable environment, right? So you're not having to like, you know, hold your head up or, or you're not really stressed out or anything like that. And you haven't eaten within the last 12 to 15 hours. That's when it's at its lowest. Okay, so some factors that are going to affect your BMR are going to be sleep. So if you're someone who sleeps 10 hours a day over someone who sleeps 6 hours a day, the 10 hour a day person is probably going to have a lower BMR than the person who sleeps less, right? Because if you're up and moving around, you need less or you need more energy. Um, that's not saying that's better for you, though. That's a completely separate thing. The age of the person, so the older we get, the lower our BMR. Uh, pregnancy and lactation, so in pregnancy and lactation, you have a higher BMR. Uh, surface area, so the more surface area there is on an individual, so if they're like really tall or they're really wide, um, then they have a greater surface area, they have a higher BMR. The state of health, so someone who, it just depends on the type of illness and like how that's affecting their current state, uh, but usually illness will increase your BMR. And then body composition uh, and gender, so you know men typically have a higher BMR than women, although they're also typically larger and they have more muscle mass, um, more, I'm sorry, more, more lean muscle mass, like muscle, because body composition plays a big role. So the more dense muscle mass you have, like muscle, is going to be a higher BMR than someone who is primarily adipose tissue. Um, endocrine glands, so the chemical messengers in your body, are going to um, tell your body or your BMR what it should be doing. So those are going to control a lot of that. Temperature, so if you live somewhere that is cold, then you're going to have a slightly uh, higher BMR than someone who lives in a warmer climate. And then fasting and starvation are going to play uh, a pretty big role in your BMR. Then we move into basal energy expenditure. So basal energy expenditure are the calories necessary to maintain the basal metabolic rate. So the calories that you have to eat in order to uh, you know, stay alive plus additional calories needed for thermic effect, right? So thermic effect has to, well, we're gonna talk about that in a second, voluntary activities and increased need from uh, catabolic processes. So thermic effect is the amount of energy resulting from the consumption of food or the number of calories needed for digestion, right? So in order for us to consume our food, right, chew up and swallow, and then the food travels through our body, right? We have the, um, the peristalsis muscles around our, our digestion sort of tract, and they move the food along. So that, those muscles require energy. And then the amount of energy it takes to break our food apart, right? All of those uh, hormones and enzymes and things like that that are being created and excreted and reabsorbed and all of that stuff that's happening. Um, everything we talked about in chapter three, right? All of that requires energy. So that's thermic effect of food. If it's we're eating foods that are really difficult to break down, we're eating very starchy foods, then we're going to use more energy breaking them down. If we're eating really simple foods that are, uh, you know, simple to break down, we're going to use less energy. So thermic effect is going to affect us, right? The more often we eat, we're, the more we're going to have to be breaking those down. If we eat a lot less often, we have to, we don't, you know, we don't require as much energy for thermic effect. Voluntary activities, this is this is everything you're thinking about. So all of the exercise and movement that we do in a day, um, you know, sedentary, light, active, active, and very active, and then increase the need for catabolic processes. So if you're someone who is, um, you know, lifting weights, or if you're someone who is sick, or you're someone who, um, you know, anything like that, th those are all going to play a role in the basal energy expenditure. And this is going to be kind of like how much energy it takes to keep you alive, like to keep your heart beating and to keep you breathing and to keep your brain functioning and the amount of calories it takes to like power you through a day. Those are going to be together, right? So BMR, how much to keep you alive, uh, and then your 
energy kind of stuff. BMR can be estimated using several methods. There's a whole very complex thing, but the basic guideline is going to be 10 times your ideal body weight equals the calories you need for BMR. So if you're me, you're five foot one uh, and female, uh, and let's not tell you how old I am, then you are going to need a roughly um, maybe 1300 calories a day for your BMR because I'm short and I'm female and I'm, you know, middle aged. And then if you are a six foot two person and you, uh, you know, should weigh maybe 180 pounds, then you times that by 10, you'll get 1800. And that's how many you need just to stay alive. It just depends on how tall you are um, and how much you should weigh for your height. So at the top, we have energy balance. We have calories in and calories out. And these are going to equal one another, right? Calories uh, in imbalances, we have calories in and we have calories out. So either we have weight gain or we have growth, right? So this means we have more calories coming in um, than we do going out. We have positive energy balance, right? This means Positive sounds like it's a good thing, but it, it also means, you know, weight gain, right? More calories in than are coming out. And then we have negative energy balance, which means that we have uh, not as many calories going in as we have coming out, okay? <laughs> coming out sounds weird. It's like um, working out. Basically, you're burning more calories than you eat, then you're going to have weight loss. If you eat more calories than you burn, you're going to have weight growth. And, um, you know, all of that awesome stuff about macros and, and that kind of stuff, that's great, but it, it has very little to do with weight gain and weight loss. So the most variable factor that's going to affect those energy needs is going to be muscle activity. So how much activity are you doing in a day? That's gonna affect how many calories you need, more so than anything else, right? If you have a lot of muscle activity, then your muscles will grow and you'll have more energy needs. The dietary guidelines and my plate guidelines address the need for physical activity regularly. Okay, so that's like the main thing that they think is important in order for you to keep your uh, BMI within reason. And so it's going to recommend 2.5 hours per week of moderate intensity activities for those substantial health benefits that they say that you need, okay? Uh, you'll see this in table 7.1 in your book. Um, and it, it says that leisure time physical activity has been associated with lower risks of a lot of types of cancer, with cardiovascular disease, with risks of stroke, um, it's just overall, it's going to be really important and, and beneficial for your health. Uh, the main activity that they think is the most important is any activity that you um, enjoy. If you enjoy the activity, then you're more likely to do it on a consistent basis. And then you're going to be able to keep it up and, uh, and to be able to get those health benefits. Uh, the estimated energy requirements, or EER, right? They are established by the National Academy of Medicine, right? They used to be the Institute of Medicine, anyway. Um, they indicate daily caloric intake needed to maintain energy balance in healthy weight, uh, healthy individuals of specific age, gender, weight, height, and level of activity. So you can go to their website and see more information about that. Um, the levels are recommended to sustain the body weight in the desired range for good health. So a body mass index of anywhere between 18.5 to no more than 25 kilograms per meter squared. Uh, all while maintaining a lifestyle with adequate levels of physical activity. That's, that's their recommendation. So stay within this BMI and exercise regularly, moderate intensity. Um, they do recommend for uh, sort of like teenagers, just as they uh, get out of puberty, that they should be at a BMI of about 22 and that uh, 
it's going to help them account for that gradual uh, decrease of their BMR over time, which is going to try to keep them within that 25 kilogram um, per meter squared thing. So anything higher than 25 kilograms per meter is going to be considered overweight and is associated with an increased risk of early mortality. So in energy balance, we are talking about that, you know, calories in equals calories out, that first one, proper energy balance is maintained. Then many healthy patients are able to control energy intake uh, with little effort. You should be able to kind of, if you stay in your um, weight range, then your body creates something called a set point. That's a totally separate thing. It's not in your book. And then um, hunger is going to be regulated by a complex network of factors. And hunger and appetite, which are two totally separate things, um, they're going to have the greatest effect on weight balance. You can see in your book, table seven, I'm sorry, figure 7.6 and box 7.2. Okay, so we have those physiologic factors that are going to affect our energy balance. These are physical things that affect our balance. And first up is the hypothalamus. And this one has two different centers in it. There is a uh, satiety center and a feeding center. So uh, in the hypothalamus, um, that's going to be really important in controlling our hunger, okay? Another thing is going to be the distension of our stomach. So, you know, when we're eating and our stomach is kind of uh, stretching, then it's going to kind of uh, send those inhibitory signals that will suppress the feeding center, which means we're going to be, uh, um, I'm sorry, reducing the desire to eat. We're going to be full. We're not going to want to eat anymore. And as soon as fat enters the duodenum, then it's going to have a strong effect on that feeding center, which is going to cause the person to stop eating. So you know how like when you eat something um, that's kind of greasy, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm good. Um, that's that happening too. And then hormonal secretions from uh, uh, ghrelin, leptin, and serotonin. Uh, ghrelin and leptin are pretty uh, important in this, though they are, uh, uh, two hormones that are produced um, in the GI tract that are going to help produce, uh, help to, you know, sort of control this or regulate this. Uh, ghrelin is produced by your enteroendocrine cells in the GI tract, and it's called the hunger hormone. So it's going to increase your food intake, okay? So this one's going to make you want to eat more. It sounds like a gremlin, right? Ghrelin. And then leptin is the opposite. So it's made by your adipose cells, uh, or your adipose tissue, your fat cells are going to produce leptin and it's going to help to control your hunger by inhibiting it. All right, so psychological factors are gonna take us into um, appetite. And appetite and hunger kind of feel like the same word, but they actually, they don't mean the same thing. So hunger is a physiological thing. It's something physical that your body feels, right? Appetite is kind of that emotion or the, the want of something. And so appetite is how we feel when we eat food. It's rewarding. It makes us feel really good, right? So if we have a large appetite, we want to eat something. Have you ever like been eating and you're you you're full, but the food is like so good you want to keep eating? That's appetite right there. So a greater weight means that the individual is responding to feelings and emotions rather than actual hunger because hunger will usually keep you in check. Uh, you don't really eat um eat too much hunger is going to give you those you know signs that says hey stop eating but appetite is going to make you keep eating boredom and stress are two of the the biggest factors that will affect um your appetite and whether or not you're paying attention to your actual hunger so boredom and stress um, if you can kind of 
get people to have a different habit, uh, like exercise, right? If you can replace boredom and stress, then you can typically get people, um, you know, who are obese to be able to lose weight, um, and you can you can um, sort of distract them from that that appetite sort of uh, cycle. All right, so I don't know why your book um, has decided to target obese women, but it's not uh, it's not very cool. So obese women typically will have uh, the same or slightly higher uh, metabolic rate than thinner women. And obviously that has to do a lot with surface area, right? So obese women have a bit more surface area that they um, that is going to raise their basal metabolic rate. Excuse me. But um, at the same time, we have to think about uh, body composition, right? So because there are differences in that body composition, then it's going to kind of balance that out, right? So even though um, larger individuals have more surface area, they also have less lean body mass. So uh, people with higher lean body masses um, will have a higher BMR. So it, it ends up kind of balanced out in the end. I know I just said that two separate times, but I feel like maybe the third time was the key. And then uh, increased physical activity is going to be needed in order to balance energy intake. Um, your book talks about a pedometer at this point, and that just by having a pedometer is going to increase um, the number of steps that an individual will usually take in a week. Um, I know I wear a Fitbit, um, and I do find that when I wear my Fitbit, I don't gain weight <laughs> as much as I would if I don't wear it. Like whenever I'm feeling terrible and I'm like getting a thousand steps a day and I am just like, okay, I, I don't need this on my wrist to, to tell me that I'm not moving around. I know I'm not moving around, right? So uh, I, I think it, it's very effective. Like when I'm wearing it on my wrist, I'm like, oh my God, I've only gotten you know, 500 steps all morning because I've been sitting at my computer recording lectures all day, um, then I'm like, okay, now it's, it's time to get up. It's time to go for a walk. So we talk a lot about like overweight, right? But we, we often don't talk about inadequate energy intake. So um, a deficiency in energy could result in a depressed rate of growth in children and weight loss in adults. Of course, obviously. So children who are malnourished as they are growing up, they typically don't grow to be um, what they should have if they had had an appropriate nutrition. Um, intentional weight loss can be both helpful or harmful. So if you go about it correctly, then intentional weight loss can be a wonderful, healthy thing. But if you go about it incorrectly, um, you know, start through, you know, excessive starvation, then that's going to be a bad thing. Like when we we're talking about BMR, um, fasting, your body doesn't understand the difference between dieting and like an actual famine. So anytime you go on a diet and you reduce calories, your body will essentially lower your basal metabolic rate in order to keep you alive. This is a good thing, right? But it's kind of a bad thing if you're trying to lose weight. So um, you have to be very careful about that. If you go too low on your calorie intake and you harm your basal metabolic rate, and then of course you decide to heck with this diet and you start eating again, well, guess what? Your BMR is lower now. So it's very easy to gain the weight again. And then uh, inadequate energy intake can also result in malnutrition. Most of the time, um, if, if you're getting a good variety and you're getting enough calories, then you're not going to have an issue with malnutrition. But if you are reducing something somehow, then you run the risk of, of not getting all of the nutrients you need. And then inadequate intake causes a vicious downward spiral in which metabolic imbalances, right, your BMR kind of dips down, um, and it's going to decrease hunger, and sometimes it can become life-threatening without proper treatment. This is also kind of talking about anorexic, uh, anorexia nervosia, um, because people have kind of a, a different idea of, of hunger. Some people don't read their hunger symbol, sim symptoms correctly, um, and so some people have a hard time with this. Uh, your book also talks about like anytime you're you have a head injury, uh, it's possible that it can harm your uh, hypothalamus, and you can either uh, 
be harmed in a way where it destroys your uh, satiety center. If that happens, then you're going to, uh, you're never going to feel satisfied and uh, you'll be like Alexander Hamilton and um, you will eat voraciously. And then if it destroys your feeding center in some type of, of accident of your uh, hypothalamus, then it's going to, um, you're, you're never going to want to eat. You're going to have no drive for that. So, um, you know, any one of these things can, can happen to an individual. And then uh, in your book, it says to refer to figure 7.7, .7, which talks about um, dieting and how um, that will affect um, your proteins and fats and things like that. So check it out. And that's the end of chapter seven.